So um, my name is Mindy Tuller. <laughs> Hard to call them. <laughs> and I, um, I facilitate this meeting. I think I know most of you. So um, welcome. And uh, sorry for the, the slightly different color screen. Um, I guess there's not a table issue, and we'll just we'll just go with it. We'll just deal with it. Now it's perfect. Oh, that's sir. Oh, there we go. The <laughs> Patrick State Easter is best yeah. in all. That's, that's right. So hopefully everyone can hear me on the call. Um, so Carly and Linda and Jenna nodding. Yes. Hopefully. So why don't we go ahead and get started with some introductions? Um, again, I'm Mindy, and so. Manager with um, Holiday Pediatrics. Great. Thanks, Carly. And Jenna? I'm Jenna Dilworth. I'm the care coordinator from Wasatch Pediatrics at St. Mark's. Okay. And Melinda? Hi, I'm Melinda, the care coordinator for UVP Timpanogos. Evaluated sooner than later, 
call around, and if you need lead somewhere to call, you're certainly welcome to call our team, and we can give you the list of some of those. Um, some of those organizations will provide that uh, diagnostic evaluation. We are we're in the process of building you know, a little cheat sheet for our team that has um, the provider, uh, the type of evaluations they do, how long of a wait it is, whether or not they take Medicaid, if they take private insurance. Um, you know, so like Eric said, if parents give us a call, we can point them in the right direction. Um, three months out might be too long, so they might need to just go to the place they can get them in. That's awesome, and I think people are going to want that. And I'm trying to switch screens here. I don't know if you can organize them into the areas of the state that they're covered. Right. So we've added that to where it is. Excellent. Great. Oh, a request because of you know, kind of what we've been doing to and finding out. Um, I think where's one of the biggest gaps in knowledge is that many of those do not take Medicaid. Um, so finding out what they want up front to do that because I think that's the, the problem with the access is there's a lot out there that can diagnose with two to three weeks, but um, many families can't access it because of how much they are actually charging. When I did a website review, a lot of people, I didn't call them working on that. I was surprised, but they were interested in that. Boy, and you know, like you're saying, generally, a lot of them take insurance, but they'll do it whereas their parents pay up front and they'll give them the information to submit to their insurance company for a reimbursement, which might not be feasible for a lot of folks. Yeah, and they can't do that with Medicaid, of course. Right. But um, even from when I was actually with Help Me Grow, there are some that they've identified that and yet families can for as low as $500. I mean, that's still high for some, but it's, it's better than. Um, yeah. I guess part of um, our, our thought would be to provide families with multiple, if they're calling around like multiple organizations, and just like anything, shop around a little bit, kind of find what's going to be your best deal and what's most feasible for you, depending on how much cash at hand you have available. And if none, then you shop. So is that something that you would share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's great. Absolutely. We can we can um, send that out in our email of the month with resources that yeah. have that little bit more information. So hopefully everything that's on your list will already be in our database. And if not, we'll certainly add it. But the, the information here is about the accessibility part of it. So great, very useful. Anybody else? Have anything? Um, I have a kiddo that I've been working with since October in this family. Um, he is 14 years old. He has dwarfism. He has moderate cognitive delay. Most likely, he's probable um, has autism. Um, he's going in for diagnosis this month. Um, language delay, um, a variety of, of issues. He has a bleeding disorder. This family got so disillusioned with um, the process when he was younger of trying to apply for DSPD and not getting on the waiting list because of some issues and they never could figure out what it was. They got denied for SSI and all that and they just kind of decided after a lot of doors shut on them that they weren't going to reach out anymore until just the rock fall and talk with his mom and she kind of felt like she had the energy to maybe try again. Mainly because her oldest daughter is caring for her son after school and her oldest daughter is going to college next year and contemplating not going to school because she doesn't know who's going to take care of this child. And so mom, that's breaking mom's heart, she's wanting to help. Um, both parents work outside the home, they do have insurance. We've, the, the main issue is trying to find after-school care for this child. We've, I've looked up at colleges, we were saying like for students, that didn't help for anything. 
we've looked at um, allies with families to find other resources. We've looked at, I called everything on the vet home portal. Um, <laughs> and um, I, we went to enable industries, and that seems like the perfect place for a family. They would provide fasting after school, and then mom could do that after work, but it's basically $25 a day. Even though, um, you know, that adds up really quickly, and they can't afford that, and even just doing one day, I said, what about maybe doing one day a week and seeing how that goes? She said they can't afford that. So now my whole focus is in looking at funding for respite care. And we applied for DSTD back in October. They are still not on the waiting list. It has been the most frustrating thing. I'm sure everyone has their story. He's still not on the waiting list despite all the testing being done for months, despite everything. I can't wait. It's been a nightmare. He's still not on the waiting list. But we're working on that. So then I'm looking for funding. Funding for respite care. And, you know, I have looked at every place I can possibly think of. I've looked at national places like the First Town Foundation. Um, most of the places like the UH, the place that you wrote about, the United Health where Children's Foundation is more medically um, based, so St. Johan Foundation, so First Town Foundation. So I just, does anyone know any of those places I can try for funding for us as part of the family? Like, I think it's going to be like, some family in Iowa has millions of dollars and, and is going to donate money <laughs> money for respite care. I can't find anything. I, I'm looking, does anyone have any thoughts? One thing to do is to try to go about in a different way of maybe see if you can get different countries so that way they can take them away, they can take them to the on to the rest of the care. They won't. That, that's a great idea for another family. They won't. What about if it's like income or medical part? It would take time. I believe so. I don't know what she said. Can we had a neighbor watch him and she was an elderly woman and he, you know, was playing but he heard her. No, enable. In this oh, it's for enable. Perfect. Okay. It would be so great. We turned towards the facility and it worked out. Same with Rod. You know, a lot of their funding comes through to you. So we, oh, I don't know. Uh, that's the biggest issue right now is there are so many families in that situation. I guess that I'm trying to have a list at, even though they're, you know, if they're way over on SSI, I don't think they're really way over. So they may want to, I think it's, it's I am so sorry, I can't remember, it's SSI, they do assets too, right? Yes. And it's assets. And they do, um, you know, they, uh, you know, they live on a farm, and so it could be some of that. Okay. So they may have a worker that doesn't understand that a little bit. Um, we found that, you know, because some of it's likelihood, they should not be counting those assets. Okay. And so it may, it may be worth it to relook at SSI with you okay. and ask those questions on. How many of these assets actually really count? Because we found, of course, those that don't question the system actually going back, they were, they were eligible. Because I think if you can get, a, and this is not so going to help, but as far as the need, if they can get on Medicaid due to being on SSI, then, um, then there's the personal assistance that they can get. At least that would could be it. You know, a little time after, or you know, to help it. And depending on if you come back with medical issues, because you've got hemophilia, there's 60 more spots that are going to open up as medically complex children's waiver probably come October. So that's not going to help. But we applied for it and um, for this kiddo. And when I talked to, I can't remember her name you now. She was our a contact person. Yeah. When I talked to her, she said that there were so many other people that had homes um, that had a way more place than So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But that's good to know. And I 
And is there a, a foundation for dwarfism? You know, I, I looked into that avenue, but I couldn't find any funding, but that's a great idea. I need to look again. Sometimes the condition specific mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. might have yeah. funding ideas or I looked at that initially, but it's been a long time and I don't and I didn't look at it in depth. You know, maybe there isn't something really robust locally, but maybe yeah. at a national level. Yeah. That is a tough one. It's so much harder, I, I think, and you guys tell me that as they get a little older and bigger and, and yeah. they're more. So let us know how that goes. Okay. So um, anybody else? That was a good one. So I just find an excellent thing that happened in the legislature. Oh yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of things that are very disappointing, but um, this particular one is a particular concern, um, and it quite divides actually families because of the issue. But it's on guardianship, where they voted to kind of take away that right of the individual to be represented. We actually have, through Cheney.org and through Cecilia Law Center and others, uh, a campaign going on right now to get the governor to veto that because even though we want it more affordable and accessible, we don't want the rights of those that can't necessarily, because this one just affects you know, those young adults with um, disabilities. We're talking now elderly and such that um, the, Unfortunately, there's a lot of abuse and, and neglect, and so we want to make sure that there's still some kind of mechanism that they go through to make sure that this is truly what they need for guardianship. And again, some families, I mean, like me, I'd be like, what's the difference? The hair is the same and such, but I really do think if, we're, if it's um, the philosophy of you know, individuals being self-directed and their independence, we need to go through this step. So there's a huge movement from the um, adult to silly side um, and many families to try to get that people. So uh, do you know the window of time um, before that would be defined or vetoed by the governor? Um, yeah, I think all this has to happen again since the legislature at the end of last week was in about um, less than 30 days. Oh my gosh, okay. All right, well, they've already got enough signatures. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we'll have more news next week. Yeah. And I did get paid a card that to say that there is, through the Utah State Courts, there's actually a self-help center. And we have um, some of the staff at the Parent Center attending meetings and stuff. And so they're, they're actually a really good resource. They're in the portal. But I was just telling her we may need to title it a little bit different for self-help so that they can really get um, to where they're going. And what's nice is for Spanish-speaking families, they have a line specifically of um, all of the issues with them not understanding the, the legal piece. Right. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I don't think they just wanted to the number of the legislative session. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, sure. Um, this is um, related to what you know, community health. Um, the um, Department of Health today is launching a, a dashboard, a website um, that is called Healthy Salt Lake, and it looks at the county, um, basically from Alta to Magna and um, the Avenue to as far south as it goes. And it's really interesting because you can go in and look at every zip code. You can see the poverty levels. And they're addressing um, helping different, um, I mean, it just looks at every disease, like um, where the asthma is the worst, where cancers are the worst, um, and how we're going to address that. Um, um, the thing that, that they're doing it's, it's really exciting. It's, they're looking at community gardens, and it was specifically asked for. So we have access; they have access to healthy food instead of just having the food pantries. 
and the spring, the cans. Yeah, they wanted to be able to grow their own food stuff. So they've identified where those um, gardens are. And those of us that are on the board are going to go around and help. We're, we're sending out a, a survey, and then we're going to go around and actually look at the gardens. And wow. See what's available. I mean, I'm really excited. That's great. So, and then um, the other thing is, you know, trying to figure out how to provide um, exercise that doesn't cost, that, that will engage people of all ages. And it's environmental, it's air, water. Anyway, it gets launched, it gets launched today. So and then you know, people can go yeah, and look at it. Great. And it's just really interesting. You can see just It's really interesting. That's great. When, when you have the actual URL, would you mind shooting that to me? Or okay. I will do that. That's great. Yeah. OK. And what's your call? Yeah. Um, Healthy Salt Lake. Great. Great. Yeah, those, those social factors are. Oh, they definitely. I to be able to see data about them. Yeah, it's the and it's an issue of outcomes. Big difference on the pediatric population. Definitely. Definitely. Wonderful. OK, great. We'll look forward to that. That's terrific. All right, anybody else? I'm learning a new computer. All right, so if we're good with um, brainstorming, then let's go ahead and get into um, the next section, but uh, where we want to tell you if anything that might be of interest to you that's new on the Medical Home Portal. So um, we actually uh, did a, a project recently um, to create some little videos, short ones, that uh, help explain um, how to use various parts of the Medical Home Portal, um, kind of focus on certain things. And so I just wanted to make you aware of those. I don't know if they would be a use to you or potentially um, families with whom you work, but we do have um, a YouTube channel, and so we've got these six videos right here. Um, and we're planning on adding more to them, uh, but these are the, the six that we started on. So one is um, kind of just an overview. The next one talks um, more specifically about how now to navigate. So it shows some tricks and tips with um, some of the, the ways the menu shows up and, um, and how you can use that or uh, search, those kinds of things. Um, then we have one that's specific about the services directory. Um, so that's something that, of course, we show quite a bit in these meetings. Um, we also have um, a very quick one about the other resources in the medical home portal, and that's something that perhaps gets overlooked sometimes. Those include lots and lots of websites that we think are of value. That they've been checked out and vetted. Um, also, a lot of tools for the practice that include things like growth charts, um, information gathering tools, screeners, those kinds of things. Um, also, any citations, so any, any literature that we've cited in the portal um, can be searched and found there. And patient education handouts, those kinds of things are also in that section. Um, then we talk a little bit about what's in the for parents and family section, which is our largest. Um, it grows regularly, um, and that's uh, something that Utah Family Voices. And the Utah Parent Center um, staff has helped us uh, to, so it's authored by peers of those, of those parents and those families. And then the last one claims that it's deleted, which is something I'll have to look into, but um, it's about our little prevalence list. Um, and Dr. Norland actually narrates that one, and that's kind of one of his, um, he likes the little prevalence list, and I don't know if we've ever showed that to you, but it's in our diagnoses and conditions section. You can actually come to this little tool here and put in the practice, your practice's size. So for instance, <coughs> you maybe change that. And then when I click change size, you'll see that the patients in your practice number will change so that you can um, get an idea. And of course, these are tough ideas that give you some idea of how many patients with a given condition you might see in your practice based on the prevalence numbers that are available for that condition. And where that condition um, is in our our uh, website, you can link right to it um, and learn more about it. So that's what those little how-to videos are. None of them are over four minutes, so and some of them are much shorter than that. So hopefully they are something that people would be willing to spend a, a few minutes looking at. Um, the next thing that we wanted to uh, tell you about that's on the portal 
is our little Get Help icon. I'm not sure if we mentioned this last time, um, but it's, uh, it's got the possibility of changing a little bit, so we wanted to um, point this out. So right here on every page except our home page, we have this little Get Help um, icon and, and link. And so when you click on it, it takes you to this page currently where um, it has a little information, not a lot, about the integrated services team who um, is available to answer a call um, during business days between 8 and 5 or answering email during the same time and then um, uh, individuals calling or emailing after hours so those get handled the following day. Um, and so this would be for families who don't have a medical home. Families who have kids who are complex, um, who need some care coordination, but perhaps that isn't available to them in their current situation. So um, probably less for you guys to, to utilize and, and refer to, but really good for you to be aware of, I think. And what we wanted to show you is the fact that we have been playing with a, a plugin, a, a piece of software that allows um, our website to understand who's visiting based on their IP address or some other geolocator. And that, we have the ability to, to substitute that icon for something specific at that point. So we're playing around with maybe changing the color to make it more obvious. And um, we had a little bit of feedback that the phone, um, A, is not accurate since they can email as well as call, right? And B, um, can be a little off-putting if you're not, it, it might signal that you have to talk to somebody when you click that link, you, you know? And that's not the message that we want. We want to indicate that this is a place for you to get more help if you're struggling um, with, with trying to figure out the portal. So uh, we'd like your feedback. So what, what do you guys think? We have to come up with something short, clearly. Not a lot of real estate. Don't want to go on ad nauseum. So does get more help in Utah make sense to folks? Some heads nodding. Feel free to say no if you don't think it helps. We want real feedback because we want to make this useful. Let, let me ask a question. I don't know if now is the time where I can chat you up later. We, we're, we're focusing so much on the icon. Like People can't get past the icon. So this is my question. Okay. Is there a way to put two icons side by side? You have a phone and a, something that indicates email or something like that so you know before you click. I mean. All it is is a click, so I mean it's no big deal. You all is rebuild as soon as you click that, right. that link. Right. But if you kind of want to know what you're getting into before you click it, could be out, you know, phone and something else, and like the envelope or you know, yeah. whatever you put on there. We could, yeah. Does that make sense to people? Lots of heads nodding. Okay. Then you know Does anyone even know what this is? No. It's like a soccer phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, he thought it was a, like a nuclear reactor. This is bad. Get help with the nuclear. Whether it's sleep, whether it's eating, whether it's toilet training, 
So this is toilet training um, for children with and youth with special health care needs. We had trouble finding a picture that really <laughs> indicated a, a child or youth with special needs, but we thought that picture was important. So that's that cute little guy. Um, but the information here is relatively general, but hopefully helpful to help a family or a, um, a provider who feels like a family might be getting close to that readiness to kind of gauge that. So we'll have um, more coming up. I think we've got one, well, I don't think it'll be titled this, but it's about GERD. That, I think, is our next one. We have a puberty case that's being worked on right now. And then maybe uh, sexual issues will come a little bit later and follow that. So we have a lot of these kind of in the works. And we're kind of excited about this because these are more focused pages on certain issues that a family might be um, dealing with and, uh, and their providers. <laughs> Wanted to let you know about that. <laughs> All right, so let's get into our discussion today on population management. Um, I really appreciate um, those of you who agreed to come and kind of share your experiences. So if you guys wouldn't mind coming up um, and sitting here, I promise you're not on the spot. We're just looking to be able to see your face and maybe ask and throw some of those questions out. So I think Heather, you were going to join us and Becca, Heidi, and Jenna, that would be great. And so while they're coming up, I'll just um, pop a couple of slides up here for you. So um, ARC um, actually has come up with their own definition for practice-based population health, um, calling it an approach to care that uses information on a group of patients within a primary care practice or group of practices to improve the care and clinical outcomes of patients within that practice. I think that's probably makes sense to all of us. Um, more and more, if I understand it, particularly with the advent of the Affordable Care Act and move away from you know, some of the previous um, ways of paying for health care, um, population management is going to become um, a requirement, I think, in primary care. So um, hopefully, again from ARC, um, what providers will be able to do is to identify subpopulations of patients who might benefit from something additional, right? And so that might include patients who need reminders for preventative care or further tests, um, maybe patients overdue for care who are not meeting some of their management goals, um, maybe patients who have failed to um, receive some follow-up even though they've been sent reminders, and then patients who might benefit from um, discussion of risk reduction. So you can see that some of this language is trying to look at maybe adult populations as well as children from art. But um, I, think we, I think we get it uh, as far as our, our um, pediatric populations go. So hopefully um, out of this population health management effort, what com could come would be um, patient registries. We've talked a little bit about those before. We touched on them in um, some of our last meetings. We actually had a meeting last October where we had um, some of the Department of Health folks and, and Gadget from UPIC talk um, specifically about uh, registries for asthma. Um, so I know that they're becoming, we're becoming more aware of them, and clearly we have some folks who are actively using them. And so I think, um, and hopefully this is what we're here, uh, that they are able to, um, they being the registries, provide uh, something of a comprehensive at a glance look at um, individual patients and populations in your practice um, in, a, in a cohort that's meaningful. You know, there's a reason that you put all of these folks together on that particular spreadsheet or whatever, so that at a glance you can what's going on with them, and, and where the, the care needs to be um, fit in if there are gaps. Um, hopefully, it also gives you an opportunity to create a more impactful care plan for those And then to track progress toward established guidelines and protocols. So we know that one of those might be making sure that an asthma patient gets a shot. Right. OK, so thanks, you guys. Um, we have folks from University Pediatric Clinic. Um, and you guys have a, is it the ADHD? Yeah, we have the ADHD registry. ADHD registry, excellent. And then we have um, Jenna, back with us from um, South Point. And Jenna, you've got a number of registries yeah. going on. A lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to feel like you have to be at their level. It's not the message is it. <laughs> and then finally, we have um, Heather, who will tell us a little bit about what's going on with integrated services um, approach to population management. And you guys are still kind of getting into this touch, dipping your toe in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so we've got some template 
um, uh, snapshots up here, but I don't want to really focus on these so much. I'll show these briefly, and then um, if we want to, we can go back and talk about them specifically. But uh, there were quite a few questions that came out of our um, request for, for um, thoughts and feedback prior to this meeting, and I want to make sure that we can get to those specifically. This is actually an ADHD registry that probably Gabby put together. Um, so it's got um, a lot that you're just not going to be able to see, but it's got a column for last name, date of birth, current primary care provider, home and work phone, on ADHD meds, it's a yes or a no, um, managed by, so uh, we've got a psychiatrist option here, CL6, D of H, uni, um, so trying to help understand how you know, who else is involved in that. Um, uh, last visit, um, specific to ADHD, um, a discharge column, uh, medication dose, and it talks about the initiation, um, <laughs> if there was a change. and if there was a change, yeah. thank you, um, from the last visit, that's pretty, some of those pretty important stuff, a screening date, um, last screen for ADHD, and then a follow-up visit due, uh, due date, um, it's due in six months three months back, kind of thinking them the actual due date for that visit, and whether or not that's been scheduled, <laughs> and then an opportunity for it. So, and then some, some kind of instructions down here. So I want to let you know that, um, that Gabby and you can, um, have said that they're happy to make these, these um, templates available if anybody is interested, and also ask, you know, provide some support getting started um, if, if that's of interest. This is a really quick question. It's call nurse, so is it an Excel spreadsheet or is it like the back end of like access database? No, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheet. And we actually, we have the template and they can be adjusted to fit your practice differently than what you know, we have here. And we're happy to work with you to add different things or to change the way the colors come up for different timelines you might have. So is this what, what you can see is you yeah, this is our, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's change a little bit, I think, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's part of it. And how, and, and what's changed? I don't know. You know, what we've got is, well, what we've got rid of, so the ones that are managed by psychiatrists, yeah. and we, we've taken those out and put in, we have a separate tab, we put them on a separate tab, but they're not necessarily off our list, they're just on a different list. That way, if they come back to us and they say, I don't like this, I want to, I want you guys to manage it, manage it, we can pop it back on and then just start everything over. Um, I know mean, you guys said you also took off people who may be working, seeing. Right, yeah. And yeah. they started in a task and they're not right. gone. Right, they're not gone. So these are the ones that we have, we have, they have Vanderbilt in their chart, but they want they want to do behavior therapy first, um, or they have it. They want to try something else different. So we've also popped those out put them on a different list, knowing that if things change, we can pop them back on this list. So we're basically using our list for medication management. Yeah, okay. that's what we're using. Our exactly. Yeah. So this is just an inside view question. <laughs> are these on the home program, or are these just your? Yeah, just just our. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So Gabby put this one together for us. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and this is just our, our. Just out of curiosity, did you guys ask for discharge date? No, we didn't. Uh, so that one, we were just kind of like. I'm not sure what that. One I we don't know what that yeah. one is either. Do you follow when they go into the ED? You see that into the ED? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. For ADHD meds, if they're going to the ED, they, they're usually managed by either like you mean or home. So, yeah, so okay. we don't. Not. They're on that separate list that we okay. don't manage there. Yeah. These are yeah. just providers in our that manage their meds, not like you or home. Okay. okay. Any any other questions while we've got this one up? And I can come back. So I, I have to admit it it is it does look a little overwhelming at first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Let me ask this question and maybe it's better answered later so you can either answer now or we'll let it percolate for just a few minutes. Um, 
why would you within your practice use the registry versus some sort of tickler or system within your electronic medical record? We don't have any anything great in our system. Yeah, you know, so like you're built within your system, just nothing that really does yeah. it for you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I think also we have we can make patient lists and things like that, which we use for some, yeah. but nothing that will let us give us a reminder if we either do for an appointment or so you have to manually keep it with every, every yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes we have some really, we have some great providers that are like, nope, every three months, and then we have some providers that are like, yeah, <laughs> so this at least kind of gives us, and if we follow the AAP grant guidelines, it's like every three months. So this kind of gives us a circle that we can work in to where um, this is what we're going to do because they are controlled substances. Parents need to know, you know. So it just kind of gives us a, a circle that we can work into and say, you know, I, we have to follow these guidelines. So. And since you guys are implementing the contract, do you think you'll add a column for that? Yeah, I've already started updating this registry because uh, Dr. Goldman Lucy, she has done two contracts. Okay. With, yeah, and she says that they went fine. Uh, parents signed them, um, and I just put it in the notes. So I was going to contact Gabby to see if we could put another column in that says contract sign date, sure. and then I can just mark it. But I put it in the, call, the notes section right now, and then we send it to Scan to Epic, so it's. Right. Right. Tell us about the contract. We have we heard on when the ADHD project and another some other teams that we can start to use the contract. That was saying like when you start medication, they like you're gonna have to come in for a daily visit. Mm -hmm. Basically because we're just getting a lot of pushback from yeah. people not wanting yeah. to come back in or bring yeah. down results in. So just them signing saying if you start this medication, these are the expectations from you. Just so that they can kind of see it coming from the provider too. And the, and the provider is the one that's actually flooding, so it's not a nurse or an MA, you know, it's actually the doctor going, I'm prescribing this for you, so these are my expectations from it. So worked so far, so two. So like a one-page contract? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Mindy from UBC Provo was generous enough to share their template. And you guys, um, they really revised it to fit their office, what they would like to do. How do they like to practice in their office? Yeah, that was great. Oh, that's, that's terrific. Okay, so who, how, how does this get touched? How does this get managed? I really manage it. Um, Becca and uh, Patty back, they have been, so they help with the call. So if it's in red, they're overdue for it's been three months and they're overdue for a checkup. Um, they'll call and they'll say, um, so it looks like you're overdue. You may or you know, may or may not get your meds filled if we don't schedule the visit. And then they can look at those things and say, oh, look, we need to send back your books out. Um, and then I usually, I will look at the schedule a couple of, about a week beforehand and I'll mark on there and say, okay, there's are there, there's they're coming in this day. I'll try and call to say, hey, are you bringing your bathroom belt? Um, so we could get that. So, so how, how often do you look at this? At daily. Okay. Do you, um, where do you know your attempts to either call or? They're logged in Epic. Oh, and okay. usually we'll put it in the note con. Okay. Sometimes I feel like if there's too many call-ups, it kind of gets a little, Whoa, yeah. <laughs> So we, we marked in the notes they attempted and then um, we just kind of keep going and then we marked it in Epic. So yeah, we did we did try to contact this, this day. Um, we've had a lot of great, I think we've, we've sent out a couple of repeats through email. So it's been nice. I don't, I don't think we've had a lot of, oh, I think it's just trying to get them back to us. <coughs> And then after a patient sends me, the doctor will yeah. route that chart to us. And, you know, if they send it for the ADHD visit, we'll update the registry. Yeah, so then I look at the dates and say, oh, they want to follow up with 45 days because there was a medication change. Um, yeah, so I'll have to look at the notes, see if there was a medication change and when for the next follow-up. And, and all your providers 
So we do have that capability. Um, this, the screen that we use as care coordination, um, as, as the care coordinator, is a screen that we used to use for our direct clinical services, but we are able to tweak that to make it work for us. We're, we're able to put in, you know, the, the um, just basic information about the patient, the date of birth, and address, and demographic, and insurance information. And we have a home screen where you know you can see all that. The medication's a problem list, and then we're able to go in and do um, an initial, like we just do an initial soap note. Um, we have a template. We go through, um, do the phone interview with the family, get a shared care um, care plan created and write out that plan. And so we have that capability. And then we have a health maintenance in the CADREC. And that's how it, we're able to say, okay, you know, this is where we are with the plan. I need to call this mom in two weeks to follow up on, on, on this. And it will, uh, I can alert it to Heather Carlson. And in two weeks that day, it will pop up on my home screen. And so, you know, that's how we're able to work with this. We're still tweaking things. We're still trying to make these templates, um, you know, more workable for what we're doing. This has all been a big process for us since we've released the data since July 1st. But we're finding that the CMR is, is working for us and not having to go back and create something completely new. Yeah. The other thing that's nice, too, is you can actually assign that help maintenance to someone else. So if mm -hmm. you know you're going to be gone or if you need help on something, maybe it's not your cup of tea, but you need somebody else to help you out on the team, so you can ask, you can assign an alert to that other person or assign that help payment mm -hmm. to another person on the team and they can also then go in and, and look at it. And that task that will show up on that person's home screen that you're sending the task to. So that's, that's nice, you can send that out to other people. So when you run a report or when you have your IT person run the bigger report, mm -hmm. the, is there the ability to pull in that kind of new note information, or I'm not sure if that comes out of the health maintenance part of things? Or? That would be more of our health maintenance part. As far as I know, when the run reports, you would not be able to do that. You know, you, you do get it that when you've got a large note that's trying to fill in, you know, the end. column 26 of this of this report. Sometimes it gets a little unwieldy. Mm -hmm. but you, you can pull that in. That's the question I would have is that on these more manually um, managed spreadsheets, that's a phase, and mm -hmm. you can then update it right, right in there. And this would be dynamically updated basically every time you run the report. So if some of that history is able to stay to some degree, that would be helpful with the, the population management piece of that, right? Um, I'm glad it's working for you guys when you're finding the <laughs> Weakage mm -hmm. is what it's all about. I think, yeah, you got what you have and you made it yeah. work as best we can. Okay. So we're also it. trying to not double and triple enter. I mean, we still have to sometimes, but that was kind of a big problem when we were providing direct clinical services. You put it in the EMR, you put it in your database, and then you had yet one more place you tracked it. So it got sometimes a little clunky to try to enter it multiple times. We need to get all of the EMR vendors. Uh -huh. In a room, <laughs> and then all of our local IT people in a room uh -huh. to try and see if we can speak the same language for a little while, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so let let me pop out of this and pull up um, Jenna's. Jenna, do you want to actually come up here and kind of walk us through this? Hopefully. Um, this won't be uh, such a different feeling laptop that you can start it out. So. All right. So this is my tier three registry. And I went through our entire patient population and read a, or ran a report. Okay, so usually this all is on one page. Um, but it's fine. So <laughs> I ran a report based on diagnoses. So um, I went through so kids with chronic care conditions and they need like a lot of assistance or they may have like socially um, complex problems. They all are on my um, tier three. And I just 
went through and deleted <laughs> all the patient information, but I usually have six tabs on the bottom here, and it's by doctor. So when I run my daily report, you see which kids are coming in that day, I run it by doctor, and that way I can go through and just really quickly update um, my registry. And this all works in coordination with my care plans and my like daily assessment. Um, the first is like their last well check, and this turns red if it's before 2015. So uh, that was just the formula that I put in when I created this last year. <laughs> so um, then I know, and I usually give them like a, a reminder through our system, like, hey, you haven't been in for a well check. Um, kids who are in blue are kids who have um, cancer or some kind of like life-threatening illness, and usually that's when, um, as long as we've seen them at, like, at our facility within the last year, um, I ignore the well check, just because they are usually frequently seeing <laughs> um, doctors. But, so then last scene is important for me. This turns green uh, when I put in the date. So it turns green. So when I pull up my spreadsheet, and I do this weekly, um, my parent partner helps me by running a report for all the patients that are supposed to be coming in for the next week. And I go through and I put in the last scene and I put um, the date in so that it will turn green when I pull up my spreadsheet in the morning and I don't have to run a report that day to see if those patients are coming in. If they were here the day, or if they're coming in tomorrow, it's turning yellow. Oh. So it will turn yellow. So I kind of have like a, okay, they're, they're coming in tomorrow. I need to prepare things for them. Um, I've added on the patient so when I highlight over it, I can just quickly get a rundown of the disabilities or the chronic care conditions that they may have, as well as any type of social information that I need for that patient. So I know I'm not talking to mom, I'm talking to grandma. Um, and that's without having to go in through all the different channels through our EMR to find out the registration information and stuff like that. And then these are the most commonly seen specialties um, that the patients have gone through. So I keep track of their appointments. So this patient has an oncology appointment on the 8th of January. Typically, if they were coming into our clinic that day, I would go through um, like help to or something to train, pull that report or that specialist letter, go through, try and summarize it so that I know when I go into the room, like what to ask the patient. Maybe they need help. Or if they missed that appointment, I put in a zero and it turns red. So I know, hey, I need to contact this patient to see if everything's okay. Um, and see if they need help coordinating their piece or their appointment. So if I get that specialist letter, and they actually went to their scheduled appointment, and they're supposed to come back in three months, but they don't have a scheduled date, I put a P, it turns yellow, and then I just go through and put like three months, so I put <coughs> And then I know to check, hey, have they scheduled that appointment? Do they need help with it? Um, if they no longer see the specialist, but they have seen the specialist, if you've been X there, that's especially helpful for me to know that I don't have to completely fill out a brand new referral and things like that. They're already in a family patient with that care. Things that I don't have on this registry because I keep them updated through the EMR is once I figure out all of the specialists that they're seeing or if we refer them to a new specialist, I keep the names of the specialists on their patient care team on the EMR. That's especially useful for our providers as well to know, hey, they've seen this person or whatever. And then on our EMR, there's like a box and it says like medical home patient. And I put in <coughs> all of their information, like all of their specialist information into that box if they have like, uh, home health if they have things like that. So it all corresponds kind of together with the, with the care assessment that I have. And then I've actually taken, and so if I know that they need labs, 
I actually have a different um, registry. <laughs> I have a different <laughs> registry for our kids who are getting chronic glands. And that will help me because I found that it was starting to get a lot. I mean, a lot of our kids with chronic conditions are getting like frequent, you know, <laughs> labs. So I just started a uh, registry for patients who are getting chronic labs, and so I don't really use that tab anymore. Does anyone have any questions? Is there any location that uses this? I actually um, we gave it to the rest of Washington. Oh, that's awesome. So we had the past two like months, um, we had some like trainings on how to use it and stuff, but the whole template was given to them and they could fill in their patient population. <coughs> I use this for tier twos and tier ones. Um, so usually all the kids who have like chronic health care conditions are on a tier. Um, tier three is the one that I'm in every single day. I, I access this at least twice a day in the morning and then in the afternoon for the next day. So they have actually been really exceptional. Once I rolled this out and let them know, like, hey, I'm trying to better manage <laughs> the kids who are, you know, kind of falling through the cracks. They call me in if they have a kid with a new diagnosis and then I can add them to the registry. They're really good about giving me the special letters that they get. So I have a box at each of the provider stations. So that I can go through and I can just keep tabs on the kids, and they, I, it like, it makes things easier for oh, them, yeah. and yeah. eliminates like all these superfluous questions. So if I can go in and assess the needs, and then tell the provider, hey, these are the things that I talked about, like they already know. Wait, we're. Please share your template. Again, again. One more. Is this what we would share? The one that you said you yeah, know, you would can. Would so yeah. everything in here is like already pre-programmed. So all of the formulas and everything are already pre-programmed. You would just have to put in your patient population. Um, and then use, of course, the same symbol <laughs> that I use so that it like, turns different colors. Um, this is what makes care coordination great, right here. <laughs> <laughs> So Jen, one of the things that I'm thinking about is this, I mean, so I can imagine this would look, you know, would be a lot more filled out. Yeah, they're so usually like 60 to 70 pieces. Right, provider. right, okay. And so you start to see these symbols underneath the specialty uh -huh. providers and you begin to understand maybe where you want to develop a more robust relationship with a, and, and that's where these, the idea of sharing kind of care and actually sitting down with that subspecialty. <coughs> office and saying how can we how can we better improve the communication and have a process and have a contact person can do some of those kind of things by glancing at the overall, oh my god, if we talk to them regularly, why don't we start to reach out or whatever. Yeah. So, this, this is really interesting. And I'm like a very visual person, so the colors are really like important to me. I can see this patient is struggling. <laughs> this patient's family is struggling. Something needs to be assessed here, something needs to be intervened if they're getting red, little red boxes across the board. So that it's just like a very quick and visual way for me to see, okay, this kid needs help or I need to reach out to these different specialties and see, you know, what's going on. And it's great to have like the the bigger system help too, like and go in and, and read some of the different notes and things that are going on and find out, oh, this is, they were in the emergency room, that's why they didn't meet these three, you know, appointments, but they were seen, those specialty team and saw them while they were there, and this is their plan of treatment, so. Let me just ask you a quick, quick question on kind of in, inner working your functionality there. So when you would hover over one of your colors on like, you know, rehab with an X or whatever, it's pulling out notes or information there. Are those just notes that you put in, or is it feeding from something else? No, I have to manually put in okay. all of these um, notes when put I. Put comment on that. Yeah, so it's like it's under data validation, and then you just add it as a message. And I used to have it where if you just scan over the name, it like pops up a, a text bubble. But when you have 70 <laughs> patients and then all these bubbles are popping, it was like crazy. 
So I just made it where even if I were to use the arrows, it comes up. And then I can just kind of go through across the row. Yeah, because it was getting really <laughs> insane. Yes? But you said you have 50 to 70 patients per provider. Yeah. What's the criteria for you? Um, these are kids with chronic conditions who are not well managed. Yeah, so they're asthma can be on here. So I have an asthma registry and an ADHD registry. Um, so, but they can they can cross they can cross. So these are the kids who in the EMR I flag on their patient chart as like tier three. So usually they have a chronic condition and then some kind of social situation whether they're in foster care or they're you know, struggling or they've been admitted to uni or something like that. So usually these are kids who actually need me to do something <laughs> for them or keep track of something or help their, their family in some way. And then I have tier two and tier one. They may have, you know, I might have a child with autism and ADHD on tier three and then autism and ADHD on tier two, but the difference is the, the social You mentioned that you could do some training for other WASAT practices. Right. Is there some documentation that you put together? Yes. I actually created like a little thing on how I use it and how I go through with the EMR. And like a little yeah. Of course. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't embarrass her. <laughs> I don't like to like go over the same thing a thousand no, times. No, no. If I can just like make one thing, it, and it's very helpful. Is that is that electronic? Uh, yes. Is that something that we could? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily send it out because I don't want to. I hate bombarding people with stuff in the inbox. But if you want to, you'll make that available to me. If you want to ask me for these, I can send them out on a one month basis. Um, but I, that would be hugely helpful. Yeah, that would be great. And it and it may be difficult because it's like using our EMR. So it may be like right. things don't apply to you, but the registry itself is how to like start it and what the input and everything like that. I did just want to do a really quick Jenna plug too. Um, she uh, last month when she sh shared the um, template uh, with us on kind of the care coordination piece, our uh, our federal folks in our grant were interested in that as well. So. Um, I asked Jenna if she'd be willing to share that, and she was kind enough to let us, and we shipped it off to our, our friends who help us with some of the QI and the um, ongoing grant management, and they wanted to put that out in just a weekly uh, kind of newsletter piece to kind of share as food for thought for some of the other organizations around 16 other states who may be struggling with this type of concept. So it was Beautiful and visual and uh, uh, utilitarian, so I think it I think it might be very useful for a lot of folks who are need a place to start. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, so I hope that we got people's questions answered. I was just looking over um, what you know what the questions were that came in, um, and somebody asked specifically about um, maintaining a registry in Help Two. So I'm not sure who that was. I don't have that. Right in here right now, but um, so I actually can reference to help too, but that's when you're looking at the notes from the specialist. Mm -hmm. um, so, do we know anything about registries and help too? Is there anyone here who could speak to that? My experience with help too has been just a, a great repository for being able to pull up documents and things. I don't know on the back end if there's a really great way to be able to do that. Now, as we're moving into Cerner, I don't know what that capability is. For Help two will go away eventually, yeah. Right. Yeah, once we've all moved over to the center. Maybe we don't want to I did, yeah. I mean, yeah. When I worked out at the cardiology, they had help. We were able to do a list of like certain disease processes like aerostenosis or hepatitis. Or, so it would pull all of our patients that fit those, mm -hmm. but that's more of a patient list. Uh -huh. yeah. And we're currently designing stuff within Cerner for the care coordination piece, so this is very timely for us to get that information in there. Totally. So thank you. That's awesome. Great. Great. See, there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Rachel just said that they are designing some of the transect in Cerner, so that's the system that they're migrating to. So this is timely in that they're seeing some of the pieces that should be there. Okay, super guys. Well, um, we're going to wrap this up. Um, I wanted to let you know about, um, a, I guess it's a, a CE opportunity. It's an all-day conference called uh, the Lung Force Expo, and if I understand correctly, it's something that is happening in cities around the country. Coming to Utah on April 30th, and there are um, five CE credits um, available through the Utah Nurses Association for those who would, would need those. It's all day on, I um, can't remember what day it is. Yeah, I don't know if that's the Thursday. I can't remember, I'm sorry, but um, it's uh, $75 for those on the professional track. Um, here is the, uh, kind of the flyer, so it's, it's available for patients and families as well as for those you know, who is, do the professional side of the Saturday. It's a Saturday, okay. and this is the professional program. Um, so I, um, I had folks from the Department of Health forward this to me, and I said, well, what's appropriate about this for our pediatric-focused um, folks? And so they talked about the fact that um, outdoor air quality and health um, certainly has a direct impact. Um, sorry. Um, the radon induced lung cancer, perhaps, and then um, certainly patient adherence um, to asthma um, would be, be a good one as well. So, not everything, but um, probably more than half. So, if you're interested, um, you know, let me know. We'll probably put a link in the, in the uh, resources of the month email that will go out if you're interested in getting more information and, and finding out for that. So, April 3rd. And then our next meeting, April 20th, is our motivational interviewing seminar. So it's not a typical meeting, and if you haven't already signed up, I think we're pretty close to capacity, so let me know if you're interested. It will take three and a half-ish hours, so it won't have our normal components. It will be pretty much the, the, whole, the whole time will be motivational interviewing. There, I asked our presenter who's coming from Texas to do this, you know, what does the room need to be set up like? And she says, there's no AV at all. It's all her interacting mm -hmm. with us. And that's why there's a cap on the number of attendees is that it starts to get too diffused with too many people because you want to be able to have those, you know, actual simulations and interactions. So I'm pretty excited. Um, we're, we'll hold it actually in the big room so that there's plenty of room for everyone. Um, we'll make sure that there's some breakfast things and she's providing lunch. And it's free. <laughs> I'm still kind of stunned. Um, you can take your lunch and leave too if you need. There's no, you don't have to, it'll be lunch afterwards and you can stay and kind of talk a little bit more about what you've learned or you can grab and go. So if you haven't signed up, it is, we are pretty close to the top. So let me know quickly if you're interested. And then um, after that, to be perfectly honest, I can't remember what podcasts were made, but we've been talking about. Um, scheduling out these for, you know, farther into the year. We're pretty excited. We have some good, good topics and good ideas that are coming up. Um, tomorrow, there's actually a, a big um, behavioral health integration summit. Um, so uh, there's been some planning efforts um, to try and identify innovations to help bring behavioral health and physical health into more of the same sphere. And uh, there will be a lot of decision makers and folks um, from across Utah who are going to gather tomorrow and talk about some of those innovations and possibilities, um, including payers. So that's pretty exciting. We've got quite a number of, of payers who will be there um, doing a panel. So they're going to be asking hard questions and they're going to need to answer them. So that should be really interesting. So we're, we're looking forward to having a mental health um, update um, uh, meeting, probably more closely to the summer. Um, to tell you what some of those uh, efforts and decisions are out of that. So that'll be pretty cool, I think. All right, well, we're actually a little early, you guys. So please help yourself to a little more food and um, mingle and chat with one another if you want. And otherwise, you can get on today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.